Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. CNBC just had this guy on uh, talking about Palantir. This guy's been very bearish on Palantir for a while now, and uh, he didn't really have any good points to bring up in this in these five minutes. I think now they're just trying to find a bunch of different angles to hit at back at Palantir, and this is what happens with a high growth tech stock. They they got rid of they they increased their commercial revenue over government. Now it's a problem that they're slowing the government. Now they invested in SPACs. Okay, if you take away the SPAC revenue, they're not growing too much. It's always another concern, especially with analysts that like to be snobby and have their own little political agendas. When it comes to analyzing a company, we are gonna break down this video. I didn't did not think that he made any strong points, especially when you actually look at the numbers of Palantir, which this guy doesn't seem to look at too much. So let's get into it. The title of this is War Spend Winner Palantir SPAC Strategy Seems Nefarious, says analyst. Let's see how nefarious that is. Tyler, great to have you with us. You've got a sell rating on Palantir, so it's clear where you stand on this. Um, and in your most recent note, you say if you back out some of these SPAC contributions, commercial growth would be would be much, much weaker. This whole thing doesn't sound good. It sounds like they're making investments in SPACs in return for contracts. Is that what's going on here? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, uh, th there's a number of these <coughs> contracts out there where uh, Palantir is invested often in, um, you know, pre-revenue companies, companies that are, you know, going public via the, the SPAC route. And in those contracts, it, it, it has provisions where those customers or those companies turn around and uh, use those proceeds to buy Palantir software. So uh, there, there's a very clear line here. Um, and in fact, Palantir discloses the amount of revenue from those uh, SPAC companies, so investors can do the math. But I think the key point is it is a big growth driver for them in the commercial business. And I think um, our concern is just that that's a lower quality growth driver <coughs> as investors um, excuse me, evaluate the performance of the company. But let's look at these stats because these stats are also really important to understand. So number one, the SPAC and private equity revenue contributed to approximately 12% of their commercial revenue in Q4. If all of their investments went to $0, they would still net $500 million in revenue when you take the loss into account. So the idea that this SPAC revenue or this SPAC growth that they're getting is like the biggest driver of their growth is absolutely insane. They added 34 net new customers, many of those deals averaging $1 million to $5 million to $10 million. The SPAC deals and the SPAC revenue is from investments they made over a year ago that are now paying off that were strategic investments. That is not uh, the, the sort of same thing as they're growing inorganically because of the fact that they're buying growth, especially if it only accounts for 12% of the revenue. The other point to understand here is that it's the SPAC revenue is not a sustainable business. It is simply an, a, a, a side business that allows them to be able to maintain levels of growth in a world in which they did not have a strong go-to market strategy back in December or, or, or September 2020 when they when they launched. They barely had a sales force. The product itself was a sales force. Carp has even said, we didn't know we were going to go public until we decided to go public. So how else do you have a go-to-market strategy? Well, one of the strategic ways to have a go-to-market strategy, especially when you have one of the biggest venture capitalists on the planet as the chairman of your board, is to invest in other companies and get them to use the product. To me, that's just the most strategic thing to do. The, you get an equity stake, you put up $200 million. What, you could spend that $200 million on a sales force? Okay, or you could invest in 14 very innovative of companies and I've done videos I've done an entire playlist on all the different SPACs they invested in you get an equity stake they use the product and as they grow they continue to use the product and you continue to have a better brand in the limelight because now these innovative companies are using your product to me it makes all the sense in the world in a world in which you don't have a strong sales force, which they didn't have a long time ago. Another really important thing to understand is if you got rid of the SPAC revenue, then adjusted earnings per share would have just met and revenue would have been slightly lower. So it's not like their numbers would have been so much more phenomenal if you get rid of SPAC revenue, you would have just tweaked the numbers a little bit, which is why it's not like the biggest thing in the world for me for them to have SPAC revenue. Just to play the other side of it, I mean, what is the risk to this strategy? I mean, you say it's lower quality growth. I mean, it's lower quality, I guess, because it's not, um, you know, they're not customers who actively want Palantir services, but they're customers who are sort of, I don't want to say coerced, but. That's an insane question. No, yes, they are using their, see, this is the problem with, with a lot of these, you have to look at how the people that are using the software are talking about the software. So if you look at Weijo, which is one of the biggest backs and their CEO talking about Palantir, uh, 
her argument is like, well, there's an incentive for him to use Palantir because they're getting an equity stake. But then if you look at how he's talking about Palantir, there's not this coerced incentive. There is, hey, this product is miles beyond all the other products that we could use and integrate within our organization, and they want to give us money. Yes, let's use them. And then you have to learn about how he talks about them. The fact that them and Weijo are literally issuing new products, and I've covered those videos on the, uh, I've covered those uh, products on the channel, like creating an entire electric vehicle charging station operating system. Like <laughs> that type of stuff is not coercion. That type of stuff is, hey, we want to use their product because their product is actually meaningful. Almost like yeah. a quid pro quo going on here. What's the downside here? Why well, not? There's nothing wrong. They're disclosing everything. It's, yeah. still, it's revenue. What's wrong with it? Right. Well, I, I think the, the concern is if you become dependent on the SPAC market, which clearly market conditions where we're at now you know, there's not as many new SPACs as there were uh, over the last couple quarters. So if that becomes kind of your your dependency on growth and the the SPAC pooling dries up, that's that's a big issue. Obviously, the the conflict of interest. Um, you know, I think this is viewed. There is no conflict of interest. This is like uh, this is kind of ridiculous to me. They are putting an equity stake into a company. That company is getting value of them by paying for their service at maybe like a discount, like. This is, uh, this is not, and, and when he's saying about the SPACs are getting destroyed, every growth stock is getting destroyed. So again, this is why I'm confused. Like the entire macro sucks for growth stocks. So, okay, you want to hate on growth stocks and SPACs right now. It's like, all right, but these SPACs are going to come back up when the entire economy clears up, just like most stocks are going to come back up. Um, now, will some of these SPACs die? Maybe, but the SPACs that are good are going to come back. And a lot of these SPACs they've invested in are good. I doubt this guy actually knows the fundamentals of each of the businesses that they've invested in. Babylon Holdings, which is a healthcare company in the UK, literally issued their guidance to expect $1 billion of revenue versus $900 million of revenue back in January because of how well the business was going. I don't know if this guy knows all the internal financials and, and metrics and growth potentials of these SPACs. He's looking at it from an analyst perspective of, oh, they're buying growth from SPACs. That's bad. That's a very Wall Street way to understand it. I mean, you could say the same thing about Tesla a couple years ago that they're just getting growth through governmental subsidies for electric, vehicle char for electric vehicles um, and, and like being subsidized and growing that way. And that's not understanding the macro level thesis and story on how a company is actually growing. Pretty controversially by uh, investors. And then, you know, frankly, just from a uh, net income perspective, they had to take a huge write down on these SPAC investments. I think, um, you know, th this past quarter, uh, their loss on a lot of these SPAC revenue uh, contracts was, was greater than, um, you know, any revenue that they've actually earned. So. Um, from a pure mathematic perspective, it, it isn't working out well. And obviously, um, I think these types of arrangements just don't set you up for sustainable growth, which is ultimately what uh, investors are looking for. Yeah, I think this guy is also not realizing that when Palantir built Skywise for the aviation industry, that was an entire platform that was just supposed to be for like logistics on, on how to build like airplanes for Airbus. And it turned into an operating system for how every airline manufacturer and, and subcontractor and vendors and then digital technology partners are using that software in order to streamline the business operations of airplanes and of flying. Uh, Palantir is now doing this with Hyundai Heavy Industries for the shipyard business and how people can make ships and how we can streamline the process for them to actually be able to make ships, get rid of ships, the logistics of ships, etc. These investments in SPACs are Palantir trying to create different operating systems for different industries. So with Weijo, they're working big on creating operating systems for the electric vehicle industry. With Sarcos Robotics, they're working on the robotics industry. With Cellularity, which is a drug discovery company, they're looking on how to implement foundry into, in, into the drug R&D process, which is a multi-hundred billion dollar market because every company, Merck, Pfizer, et cetera, needs to do R&D and drug discovery at an accelerated pace so they can have new drugs, so they can save people's lives. So Foundry, to me, being implemented in these small little SPACs is trying to test the waters on like what's the next Skywise? What's the next major platform that we can build for an emerging industry that has multi-hundred billion dollars of TAM? And how can we get a sliver of those multi-hundred billion dollar TAM industries within Palantir and be that central operating system for these industries? And I don't think this guy is getting that. Like, he He's just he's just sounding like an analyst. And I mean, if you're going to sound like an analyst, that's fine. But you're not really getting the crux of the argument here. Tyler, this time last year, I think Palantir got caught up in the whole WSB Reddit crowd. It was a forty five dollar stock. It looked like the sky was the limit. Probably the worst thing that happened to him. I was on that bandwagon incorrectly. But is there an argument to be made, obviously, too reliant upon the government? If they could figure out sort of midsize business, sort of a downscaled offering to those businesses. Does Palantir make sense at a certain point? 
Yeah, I, I think that's an area to watch for sure. I mean, I think our concern has been it's it's been a business that has, you know, very high exposure to the government, 50, 60 percent of revenue. There's there's very few software companies out there that have that type of exposure. And, you know, this this is a bit a business that's been around for a while, despite the recent public listing. And, you know, they, they count only a little over 100 customers. And so. You know, our- yeah, so again, I, I don't think this guy is understanding the growth potential here or like what's actually happening. Number one, they've been around for 17 years, but we're not actually operating in the commercial sector really for since the last five years. So when people bring up this argument, it shows they don't really understand Palantir. They've been subsidized for the government. They were building technology and product. They were a startup for a long time, and now they're operationalizing in, in other sectors of of commercial growth. The, the second thing is the commercial growth. I mean, when you say they only have 100 customers, but you're forgetting that they grew 300% with those customers, that's like, you're manipulating the numbers here. And you're not really making a strong argument. Now, the Wall Street bets thing and them getting caught up in the hype, that's definitely sure. And a lot of companies got, hot up, got caught up in the hype there. Uh, and what he's also been talking about is, can you modularize Foundry? And I think that's, that, that's, that's a very good question. That's an important thing to do. But saying that they have exposure to the government in a world in which their commercial sector is growing literally three times more than their government sector and now people are worried that they're not growing enough in the government it's like you can't win at this point they have too much exposure to the government they don't have enough exposure to the government they only have a little bit of commercial customers but they're growing which is how you value a company like after two years of being public or one and a half years of being public so again i think this analyst kind of misses the entire story around palantir and he just says they're growing through SPACs, which isn't really an argument our view is that a lot of customers have, have looked at the uh, the Palantir technology and, and passed on it. It doesn't mean that they they won't ever revisit it. But I think if you if you really dig down and deep and, and understand what Palantir is, it really isn't true out of the box software. It's it's really kind of packaged custom software that that's being deployed by Palantir's engineers. And so I think that type of motion very successful for the government. I think we're we're optimistic that Palantir can continue to grow in the government. Um, but in the enterprise, that's just not the way that software has historically worked. And so, um, you know, we're, we're keeping an eye on the total customer number, but mm -hmm. the fact that that number is kind of being polluted by these SPAC deals, um, you know, we just haven't really seen any signs that they're, they're turning the corner. But I think it's definitely something to watch. Yeah, so his last argument is basically like, look, they are not growing the way a traditional enterprise software company should. It's not out-of-the-box software, something like a snowflake. It is a lot more customization, all that stuff like that. I mean, those are valid concerns. I think that Foundry will be modularized. I think it will be a world in which someone can just sign up immediately. I think the foundations of the things that they're building are ultimate, and the tech being just 10,000 times better than any other product, being differentiated than most of those out-of-the-box softwares. That's why you're betting on the growth story and potential of this, right? Snowflake is already a $100 billion company. You're likely not going to get a 10x on that, right? It's just likely not going to happen. It's probably not going to go to a trillion dollars because of the fact that they already have thousands of customers. They already have this basic uh, data storage platform. Palantir has a fundamentally differentiated approach. There is artificial intelligence. There's machine learning. There's a lot of different edge cases, edge AI uses of that. I did an interview with CodeStrap about that. You guys can check that out. There's so many nuances to the technology of this platform and the ability for this platform to scale that looking at it in the short term as, oh, it's not out of the box, I can download immediately, I can get up on it, isn't a negative to me. To me, it shows that there is a differentiated use of the technology. Now, does the business have to figure out how to make it more out of the box friendly so that they can scale long term? Absolutely. But to deny the core thesis of the technology and just put the business case on top of it that they can't scale immediately right now, to me is a little silly, especially when I think uh, it, the entire point of 2022 is going to be figuring out how to modularize Foundry, how to build that developer community, how to get people using it immediately without there having to be much startup costs. So, yeah, I mean, I think this analyst has some big points, uh, but if you're going to say the SPAC revenue is hurting the growth and that's why you want to sell it, to me, growth is growth. Like, growth is growth and cash is king. And if they're getting growth and they had a strategic go-to-market strategy and they made really strategic investments in these SPACs because other companies weren't able to do it and they were able to give them their, their they, they were able to sell their software as a result of making these investments, that's strategic to me. That is something you have to do when you don't have traditional sales forces and when you have a very unique company that's been around for 17 years. So... To me, I don't think that's necessarily a concern to sell off the stock. I'll be doing some more videos soon talking about the SPAC strategy and going a little bit more deeper into it because it seems like that's the newest, biggest concern for Palantir. So we will debunk those myths as well. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know your thoughts on what you guys think this analyst said, and I will see you in the next one.